Okay, continuing the calculation now that I've freed up some disk space, what I'm going to do is a couple of things. I'm going to realize, yeah, I, I already crossed these out. Um, I'm going to cross out these H's. I'm going to cancel these H's against one of the H's here, and then I'm going to distribute that one in. And I'm going to play a little bit more with the algebra as well. The main thing, I'm not doing anything fancy. I'm just keeping, I'm keeping these guys paired together. But I'm just realizing that times h divided by h squared is an over h. And then they also have a factor of i. Oh, and then this, that has a minus i, so that turns into a minus. Hey, that's interesting. That should look familiar. When I take the limit as h goes to 0 of such a thing, it's the symmetric version of just the ordinary derivative of f at z0. Okay. Plus limit, uh, let me put it in the second line, plus, sorry. Limit at h goes to 0. OK, now what else do I got here? OK, here I don't have an i, but I'm going to fix that in a minute. I still have the h over h squared phenomenon. OK. Um, and now I still want to keep this one a plus, and, this, and I want to put a minus in front of here. OK, so I'm going to change that to a minus. I'm going to factor out a minus sign. And then this is going to change to plus. And remember, this is the one where I'm wiggling up and down, and I'm comparing the values above and below. Okay, Still the same idea, though. I'm starting at z0, and I'm symmetrically changing by half of ih one way and half of ih the other. Okay, So if I were going to look at that as a the top of a derivative, what I should divide by is what I've wiggled by, which is ih. Oh, OK, well, but this was an h over h squared. There's no i in it, so I just need an i to cancel it. Oh. Hey, that's cool. Now there's a common factor of i. I'm just going to scoot that out, the whole thing. OK. So this is very interesting. OK. It's i times, this is exactly the derivative of f, specifically just going in the real direction. Then I'm subtracting the derivative of f, specifically going in the vertical direction. Now, what was supposed to be true if f were really a complex differentiable function, a complex analytic, or sometimes called a holomorphic function, something that has a complex derivative, these should be the same thing. That was the whole thing that was special about functions that had that kind of derivative. Remember z bar, for example, the conjugate, or some random combination of real imaginary parts did not have these guys being equal. But anything like z, z squared, e to the z, ln z, those do have that property. Okay, So I'll just write down, re it's i times the real sort of directional derivative minus the imaginary directional derivative. The point being that that's 0 if the honest to god full f prime of z exists. OK, so you might not think that's such an amazing calculation, but it really is. It's, such a, it's a great calculation um, because what have we shown? OK, so from now on, let's assume that f is complex differentiable. Lots of synonyms for that, holomorphic, complex analytic, a lot, of, a lot of words for it. But let's just say differentiable in the complex sense. Okay, f prime of z really exists and is independent of the how, how you take in the complex plane. Okay, um, Then this microscopic little bit of um, closed curve contour integral is all, always 0, no matter where you take it. So that would be 0, and that would be 0, and that would be 0. Oops, run away. And notice what's happening here on the little interior boundaries. Let me, let me do a close-up of that. If I take two such things, this is just a, a close-up view, those guys cancel out. Okay. So the integral over this bigger, slightly bigger region is 0. And the integral over all those put together is 0. Well, wait a minute. What if I have a huge region? So this is not a microscopic picture anymore. I'm going to segment it up into a bunch of little pieces. Okay. And I'm going to realize that the integral around the boundary is the sum of the integrals around all these guys. Because every time we have an internal boundary, I'm traversing it one way and the other, and they cancel out every single time. So here's this guy going counterclockwise. If I go this guy next to it counterclockwise, the boundary where they share cancels out. 
So the contributions to all the internal boundaries cancel. And this is, I'm glossing over some details, it says that the integral over the closed, this whole closed curve, let's call that C, the whole boundary of this region of f of z dz is just the sum of the local integrals, but those are equal to 0. Okay, so um, that's, if you might want to look at my uh, proof of Green's theorem video because this is really emulating what the, the argument was for that. But basically, if something, if I have something that sort of, sort of measures the local density of how much circulation you have, how much of a closed curve integral you have, if that's always zero, then any closed curve integral is going to be zero. Okay, So it's really this very straightforward calculation that, that tells us, hey, it matters, it, it, it is detecting whether these two different directional derivatives are the same. Um, and that's zero if the thing's differentiable. And then the rest of it is just that it's this simple argument about putting together those local pieces into a global calculation. Okay, so the the uh, the theorem here is that let's just summarize it. If f is complex differentiable, now it has to be on the whole interior on a region R. Okay. So let's say it's on this whole region R, including all inside, okay. Um, uh, then, let's see, so, let's see, how should I say this? Um, let's say, with no holes, okay. The terminology, the official terminology for that, simply connected. I don't know if I want to get into that too much right now. Um, then, integral of closed curve equals zero for all closed curves. This doesn't say anything about a curve that has endpoints. That's not that doesn't start and stop in the same place. Okay, all closed curves in R. The reason it had to have no holes is that no matter what this curve is, I've got to be able to do this pr process of cutting the up the interior in the, into little bits and figuring out the circulation of zero on everywhere on the inside. Okay, so this is very, very cool. Let me talk a little bit about consequences of that. First of all, it, it matches up with stuff we've said already. Okay, so remember if f of z were z to the k, I did a very explicit calculation with a circle showing that that integral was zero. But it actually says that even if that curve was like this, as long as it starts and ends at the same place, that integral would still be zero. And that's a much more sophisticated result. Okay. Now, um, remember, we did have another proof of this because it was an antiderivative. And that still, that proved, or it has an antiderivative. Um, that proves the more general result as well. But the Cauchy result is more powerful. Okay. Um, but what about, what about, ooh, k equals minus one. Let's go back to that one. What if f of z equals z to the minus one or one over z? That's a minus one there. Okay. There, we didn't get zero. Okay. Is this a contradiction? Is this something we've missed? Well, no. Okay. It's because this guy, this guy blows up at the origin. Okay. I cannot define that at all, much less continuously, much less differentiably at the origin. So, if I take a closed curve integral like we did before, like the circle of radius a around the origin, I can't use this theorem to show that the closed curve integral is zero. By the way, this is the simplest version of what's called Cauchy's theorem. I should give it its right name. Okay, This idea that the closed curve integral of a differentiable function is zero. Um, so it doesn't necessarily apply. The simplest version doesn't apply to 1 over z. Okay, What was the uh, the answer for that, remember, it was 2 pi i, and it didn't matter what a was, okay? That I can explain with this idea, okay? Because, for example, between two circles of different radii, I can fill in that region, okay? That is something, is a region where this function is complex differentiable. I've avoided the zero. If you've done any problems with Green's theorem, this is going to look very, very familiar. And in particular, if you've applied Green's theorem to the vortex vector field. Okay? And I'll remind people of the connection in just a second. What we do is we apply the theorem we just proved 
to this region, its boundary is exactly this curve and this curve in the opposite direction. Okay, So that shows you, let's say this uh, had radius A prime, it says that the integral of CA of dz over z minus the integral of CA prime, because we're going in the opposite direction, that's going to be zero. Because this region is something where there's where I do divide it up into the tiny little pieces, I'm never going to see anything because this is a perfectly nice function away from zero. Okay, that says that these guys are equal. And so they're all equal to 2 pi i. Well, that's that applies whether or not it's a circle or not. Even if this is some funky curve, any curve that encircles the origin exactly once is going to have this number 2 pi i. Uh, let me just take that a tiny bit further before I end this video, and we'll I have a couple more. Um, suppose I have a curve that winds twice around the origin. So here's the origin, like that. Okay, so here's our curve C. I wonder what I should get if I dig the curve and I integrate dz over z around that. That's not too hard, because I can actually separate it out, okay, into curve C1 and curve C2 both of which wind exactly once around. So here's curve C2, here's curve C1. I split it up and kind of reorganized how it was traversed, but that shouldn't matter, the order of things are traversed in, okay? And so that should be the integral of C1 plus the integral of C2. Oh, it's two times two pi i, okay? And in general, what it is, is it's the winding number or the index of, um, around the origin of this curve times 2 pi i. So this is called the index, or a more pictorial for, form is winding number. And in fact, this winding number, if I just say, can you come up with a really rock solid, rigorous way to define how many times a curve winds around a point in the plane? It can be a little tricky. Um, to come up with a really good definition. A lot of people just go ahead and use this as the definition because we know a lot about calculus and there's lots of theorems and all kinds of stuff. Um, and that actually is a very, it turns out to be a very good way. It's just 1 over 2 pi i times whatever this integral is. So again, let me make a connection for people who have done a little vector calculus, which probably is most of you if you're watching this video. The vortex vector field, when I keep referring to that, it's just minus yi plus xj over x squared plus y squared. That's this vector field that's strong in the middle, not as strong outside. And what's special about this is that the scalar curl of v, which is just a nice pictorial name for dq dx minus dp dy, that's everywhere zero except, of course, at the origin where this thing blows up. And it has the property just like dz over z that a closed curve integral of this guy, except for the i, it's the same. The integral of c of v dot dr is 2 pi if it goes around simply, and it's really 2 pi times the winding number in general. So these are extremely closely related. The only thing that we're missing here is the i because there's no, there's no complex uh, imaginary unit there. Okay, But um, absolutely, there's a huge um, relationship. And it's even the algebra, of course, relates. Because if you refer, go back to um, 1 over z, what was that? One way to write it was z bar over z z bar, or z bar over magnitude of z squared, or x minus i y over x squared plus y squared. Oh yeah, you kind of start to see the, the, uh, the relationship here. Okay, Very, very similar in terms of the algebra and the geometry and topology. It's good for this one.